Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to Puyallup Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's good to see everybody. I hope you had a good week. We're in a series called Becoming God's Gift to the World, where we're exploring this concept of stewardship in terms of being a gift to the world. We believe fundamentally that Jesus Christ is the greatest gift that the world has ever been given. Would you say amen to that? And so if I'm a follower of Jesus, it, it just should go without saying that my life should be a gift to the world, every facet of my life, not just my finances. And so we're doing several little mini-series within this umbrella theme of becoming God's gift to the world, and we're in one on communication. And we've talked about our words, we've talked about, I think uh, last week Pastor Mike talked about the ethics of our communication. You know, there is a moral component to how we communicate. It's not just neutral communication. And today we're going to get into uh, one of my favorite aspects of this important practice uh, that can have the potential to change the world. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for bringing us all here. Thank you for uh, the variety of personalities and experiences that have been brought here today. And as we come together as a unique and diverse body of believers and maybe non-believers or questioning believers, uh, God, may we just have a sense of your presence here. May this be a loving community that enjoys wrestling with truth and your word. And we recognize whenever we come together, uh, Sometimes we have expectations, and those expect expectations can be good, they can be indifferent, or they can be bad. And on this day, this Sabbath day that you've created to be a temple in time, a, a space where we can rest and be at peace, I pray somehow supernaturally by your spirit, help us to set all our heavy burdens and our anxieties and our stresses and our worries and, and thoughts about how we're gonna pay the bills and, and the argument we had with our spouse on the way over here that isn't resolved yet, all those kind of things, help us to set them down right now and just, just bask in your presence and hear your word with clarity. Jesus, I thank you for guarding our hearts and minds and blessing us here this morning in your precious name. And everybody said. Amen. I was six years old, or I should say, it was my sixth birthday when I discovered my first swear word. It wasn't a present my parents, uh, it was a present my parents never intended to give to me. It, it ended up being a gift that kept on giving. Now to be fair, well I should say this, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a veggie swear word either. It was a full-bodied, four-lettered exercise in the offensive. I don't know where I heard it. I didn't even know what it meant. But the pious gathering of conservative Seventh-day Adventists in northern Minnesota that were attending their pastor's son's birthday party knew exactly what it meant. <laughs> and when I let that word fly on that warm summer afternoon before God in the presence of those witnesses, the mood of that birthday party shifted from sacred to scandal faster than you can blow out your birthday candles. I said it for the first time in the treehouse among my friends. And when I said it, they recoiled in shock and horror, which when you're trying to offend people or irritate them, the reaction is what you're after. That is the whole point of the exercise. And so I got the reaction and I said it again. Eyes widened, there was a gasp, and one little girl said, I'm telling your parents. And she began to scramble down the treehouse ladder. And of course, I scrambled down because I knew I was going to be in trouble, and I had several friends following me. And so what happened next was that we began to run. I began to run, saying this word at will. And we had this round house with a deck, so you could literally run around the house. And there were windows where my father and my mother and their conservative parishioners could watch their son leading the profanity parade <laughs> in surround and around and around sound. And I said, and I kept saying this where I was followed by people who, who, who were morbidly curious, say it again, say it again. And so I said it again. And then there were these other people who were following me who were horrified, stop, you're going to be in trouble. And I was, I was so drunk on power and, and attention that I didn't notice the loose board in the patio. And I tripped and face planted right in front of my father, who in addition to saying, watch your language, had a, had a variety of other unique words for me, and none of which were happy birthday. <laughs> They were sad, offensive, inappropriate, we're gonna have to move, <laughs> never pastor again kind of words. 
And because of the word that was spoken at my birthday party and the words that, that subsequently described that birthday party, it has changed how my parents and the parents of their grandchildren now craft and execute and secure birthday parties. How we remember things or how we speak about the past or how we speak about concerning the future has the potential to change the way the world functions. We tell stories, we quote other people in order to pass on lessons that need to be repeated or avoided. And we repeat these things until our children start to pick up the expressions and say things and repeat things in front of other people. One of the most terrifying things as a parent is when you are listening to your child and then you suddenly realize, you sound just like my mother. It's second only in horror to, I sound just like my mother. You've had that experience before. And so it takes us by surprise because we realize that these expressions reflect ways of thinking that impact ways of behaving that are being released into the world. And these ways of expressing and thinking and behaving have the potential to change the culture and to change the world. Take a look around you right now at the person sitting next to you, behind you, and in front of you. Give them a good, long, awkward look. Just, just stare them up and down. Go ahead. We can, you, we can have a social experiment this morning. You have the potential this morning, based on how you communicate, to change the trajectory of people's lives in this room. Whether you greet them or ignore them, give them a warm smile or a cold shoulder, whether you laugh at their pain or don't laugh at the punchline of their joke, whether you make eye contact with them or just stare at a part of their body for a long time with a horrified expression or a delighted expression. I'm not sure which one would be more awful. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 1. First book of the Bible, first chapter, we get insight into how God creates the world. Genesis chapter 1. We're going to breeze through, sort of float through a little bit here, but, but verse 3. And God said, let there be what? And what happened? There was light. And God said, let there be an expanse. End of verse 7. It was so. Verse 9. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. Let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants, yielding seed, trees bearing fruit. And it was so. Verse 14, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens and separate them. Let there be day and let there be night. And there was day and there was night. And verse 20, and God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let there be fish and whales and sharks and jellyfish and starfish. Let it happen. And it just, it just happened. Then God said, verse 24, let the earth bring forth living creatures. Let there be animals. And then, of course, verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image. And God makes man. God essentially names reality into existence. He names reality into existence. He, he identifies how he wants the world to be, and matter appears, it responds and restructures, and time begins to tick. And once everything is in its right place, he, he puts one more final holy adjective on the whole thing. He says, this place is very good. Telling us that it's complete, it's holy, it's sacred, it's safe, it's where you want to be. It's a place to live. And then God does something weird and extremely dangerous. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 19. God forms man. And then it says, Also out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. God permits his own creation to name the reality that he created. You have the creation co-creating with the creator. Now you think about this concept. This is like, you know, picture a New York Times bestselling novelist, your favorite novelist. You know, you've got, you've got John Grisham, C.S. Lewis, you've got Tolkien, R.R. Martin, Jane Austen or Francine Rivers if you have to. And they have crafted this story, this, this, this literary masterpiece that's going to change the landscape of literature forever. It's going to be on the New York Times bestseller list. And they come to you, of all people, and they say, look, I've crafted this story, but I want you to name all the characters in my book. I want you to name all the places, all the works of art, all the unique gadgets in my book. You name them. Or picture an artist making this huge canvas. 
Maybe it's Michelangelo or Picasso or Raphael or, or whoever you can think of. And they leave the color out. And then they hand you the paint and say, you determine the color of this landscape, of this portrait. Or picture your favorite chef putting all these incredible ingredients together in the pot and then looking at you and saying, here is my spice rack. You put flavor in here. That actually fits with what Jesus says in the Gospels when he says, you are the salt of my world. I love how the message translates it. It says, you are the God seasoning that brings out the God flavors in this world. Even after sin enters the world and tears the world apart, the naming continues. We still name our children. We name locations. We name cities. We name countries. We name feelings. We name circumstances. We name behaviors that go along with the circumstances that we just named, the locations that we've created. And, and that naming and that communicating, however it happens, changes and creates culture changes and creates parts of the world. Our acts of communication, whether they're verbal or written or nonverbal, can change the scenes in a person's life and that can go on to change entire scenarios in human history. Let me give you an example from the Bible, one of my favorites, and it's found in 1 Samuel. In the background is David is on the run from King Saul. Saul is jealous of David. And David runs to Gath, and it's sort of at the southwestern edge of Saul's kingdom. And he's in this place called Gath, which is ruled by a man named King Achish. And, and King Achish is, is a buddy or a supporter of Saul, and King Achish probably translate to, translates to King Angry. You don't want to be in King Angry's territory when you're already a fugitive. This is a bad scenario, and David's life is in danger. So David decides that he's going to change his communication to change his circumstance, his circumstance which is ultimately going to change the world. 1 Samuel 21, 12 to 5. So David changed his behavior before them and pretended to be what? Insane. Insane in their hands. And he made marks on the door of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. This is not a high-profile fugitive. This is a crazy person. Look at all those nonverbals. First of all, he's, he's at a location by the gate where beggars and outcasts are supposed to be. He's drooling everywhere. And he's clawing at the gate. This, this, is, not, this is the guy who supposedly killed 10,000 to, to Saul's 1,000? No way. And look at, look at how King Angry responds. This is one of my favorite, favorite passages in the Bible. One of my life verses is in here. Then King Angry said to his servants, Behold, you see this man is mad. And here's this question for those of you who have have been king angry or queen angry before and nothing is going right and your kids are acting up and they're swearing at their own birthday party and you say, why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Do I have a shortage of crazy in my kingdom? <laughs> Do I need more crazy people? You want me to bring this guy into my house and they leave David alone because he changed the way he communicated. And because of the way he changed the way he communicated, he changed the scene in this part of his life, and he changed the culture in that particular scene. He changed the mood. As a result, David could live to run another day and eventually live to rule another day and to communicate the book of Psalms to us. And how many lives and worlds have been changed because David was able to write the book of Psalms? How powerful is the gift of communication to change the culture and the world. Let me give you a contemporary example. In the news this week, I heard the story of 14-year-old Alondra Luna Nunez. It's a picture of her. Some woman in Houston, trolling social media, saw her picture and said, this is my daughter. Who, I can't remember if she ran away or was taken away years and years ago. That is my daughter. She is my child. And based on this one woman's testimony, authorities went down to Mexico, grabbed this 14-year-old girl out of her house and shoved her in the vehicle and drove her across the border. Now, those of you with children, imagine sitting there, family dinner, family picnic, family reunion, family movie night, authorities break in, grab your child, inform me that this is not your child anymore, and take her to another country to be with somebody else. How would you feel? Thankfully, someone, you see this picture, this is a snapshot from the video that someone was taking. And that video went on the internet. And there's a lot of stupid stuff on the internet, but sometimes the internet is incredibly useful. 
That video went viral. Her parents went on radio and the voices began to swell, the communication began to expand and people were calling for a DNA test. There wasn't even a DNA test done. And finally, the, the frustration in the, in, in the world, in, in the international community, the outrage moved these authorities to finally give a DNA test. And there was a Maury Povich moment. I'm sorry, ma'am, this is in fact not your daughter. And the authorities are forced to take this 14-year-old girl and reunite her. Go to the next slide. There she is with her family back in Mexico. Now think about this. How many worlds were turned upside down because one individual misnamed something? How many worlds and cultures were radically shaken because somebody had one poor act of communication that misidentified reality? One woman in another country said, that's my daughter, and turned everyone's world upside down, but thankfully there was enough people to say, no, here's the way reality really is, Amen. and put the world back where it was supposed to be. You and I have been entrusted with an incredibly powerful gift whether it's verbal, nonverbal, whether it's written, our ability to communicate creates culture in our families, in our churches, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our communities. How we communicate literally changes the world. We have inherited this gift from God through our parents, Adam and Eve. And what I want to, you to internalize is this lesson. Go ahead and throw this on the board here. Every act of communication is an act of creation. Every single act of communication is an act of creation. So the question is, what are you creating? When you watch how your family operates, when you watch how your marriage is functioning, when you're watching how your, ch how your church is worshiping, you know, it's, it's a weird phrase, watch your language, because you can't see the words, but you can certainly see the effect that they're having. What culture, what world are you creating with your communication? How we respond to circumstances identifies them, defines them, and determines how we communicate and how other people communicate who are watching us for cues and watching us as models to know how to communicate, like our kids. So how do you communicate when you get good news? How do you communicate when you get bad news? So you noticed last Monday our buyer backed out in our house and I appreciate my, my wife's calm attitude of hopeful, positive faith, which tempered my passionate attitude of someone's going to die. <laughs> and my misquoting of Revelation 14, 20, the blood will rise as high as the horse's saddles for 200 miles. <laughs> and many of you have spoke encouraging words of faith, you know, to me. Help prevent my house from becoming a, a, a depressing, dark place of bitterness into a place that's hopeful and is trusting in God's leading. And in terms of bitterness and frustration, having your will blocked in life, how do you respond to change? Either change that you know has to happen or change that's, that's pushed upon you by circumstances. Do you complain about change? Because if your response to change is to complain about it, you will create a culture of complainers. Is your response to change and the need to change passive-aggressive behavior? Because then you're going to produce a culture of passive-aggressiveness that never actually deals with the issue and just makes everybody angry. But when change comes, do you have open dialogue, loving open dialogue that's solution-oriented? Because if you do that, then you will have a loving community that has open dialogue that's full of innovators. In terms of worship at our church, our church culture, would you like better singing and better musicianship? And not that we don't have it, it's good. But if you want better singing, Start singing. If you want to really experience the presence of God here, if you want something tangible, you are going to have to learn to respond when the musicians are up here and the, and the worship leaders are leading. You will have to put forth an effort. The worship experience will be better. I hate to say this next part because this damages my fragile ego. If you want better preaching, <laughs> preach with me. Respond and interact with me. We do worship together. 
We preach together. The best moments of my preaching career have not been planned in the study, and that pains me to say that because I work hard on these sermons. But when I have been in an atmosphere where there is a give and take and there's an exchange and it fires me up, when I start saying things that I never thought of, but they, they're, they're there, and I think, wow, it's, it's because we are communicating with each other. And it's not that you're not communicating when you're silent and stiff and staring at somewhere else. You are communicating. <laughs> Indifference and disappointment. That's hard to sing to. That's hard to preach to. Now, don't go too crazy. <laughs> because I also preach longer when I preach better. So don't sort of curb that in a little bit. But most importantly, what does your communication reveal about the character of the God that you serve? Your communication at home, your communication at church, in the hallways, the parking lot, at work, around the water cooler, wherever, where, online, on Facebook, on Twitter, what does your communication reveal about the God that you claim to follow and you claim to serve? We are called even to love our enemies. That is so hard to communicate in a loving way with people we strongly disagree with. How do our disagreements with our enemies reveal the loving nature of the God that we serve? We are called to, to have the mind of Christ and to communicate the mind of Christ and to create kingdom culture, but a lot of times in our culture we, we, we praise just individuals for, for speaking their mind. I've had this said about me and maybe you had it said about you or you know somebody, you know, they, they're someone who speaks their mind. Let me give you, let me, let me clue you into something here, a little social cue here. That's not necessarily a compliment. <laughs> Speaking, when someone says, you know, they speak their mind, what they may be referring to is not honest communication so much as there's a filter missing between your brain and your mouth. <laughs> Somebody wants to testify. <laughs> <laughs> but you and I are called to co-create kingdom culture everywhere we go that brings Christ's glory. And here's the beautiful part about this. Unless you are clinically brain dead, everybody in here has the ability to communicate. Everybody. You can't not, not communicate. It's incessant. Everything you do is an act of communication. As a matter of fact, our ability to communicate is what sets us over and above creation. I mean, we can even, we're even able to talk about how we talk. We can communicate about how we can communicate. As far as we know, dogs don't bark about how they're barking. And think about even our ability, a spirit-led ability to say no versus an instinct-driven ability to have to say yes. It's an incredible gift. And so this morning, my challenge to you as a people with a desire to communicate truth and to create a culture that reflects Christ and to shape worlds that bring him glory, let us take time to watch our language. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for giving us the ability to speak, to communicate with our bodies, with, uh, with, uh, with writing utensils, on our computer, everywhere we go. God, help us to understand this incredible gift that you've given us is not just some way we, we get our to-do list done, but this is, this is a way that we create kingdom culture and change the world. God, help us to be self-aware of our communication, especially when we are stressed, especially when things are not going well, especially when we are angry and upset at somebody. Help our communication to build up life and to create the kind of world that reveals your glory. Bless us now as we go forth from here, communicating with each other. In your name we pray, amen.